Hi, this is Theory Station, and I'm John Duggan. This program is the Rational Choice Modeling Program. The series that we're in is the Basic Formal Theory Toolkit series, and this is installment seven in the series. So um, in the last few installments, we've been talking about this one-dimensional policy choice model. And um, this installment, uh, well, we've done various things. Um, but in particular, we, uh, in, in one version of this model, we said, um, suppose a policymaker makes a proposal, but then there's a vote. Um, and there's a, a voter who compares that proposal to some status quo. And, um, you know, the politician has to get the approval by that voter to get their policy through. Um, in the last installment, we said, well, in fact, with this kind of natural structure, um, in this model, we can have any number of voters. We assumed an odd number, but basically the median voter was pivotal, and um, and we could just kind of ignore the other voters and focus on the median voter. So um, in this installment, what I want to do is uh, endogenize the status quo, all right? So, Previously, we didn't say where that status quo policy came from. We just said, you know, we, we took it as given, or the term that's used is it was exogenous. Uh, now it's going to come out of a richer model of politics. So we are here talking about the one-dimensional policy choice model. Um, and the, uh, the variations that we're going to say we have an endogenous status quo. All right. So let's lay out the model um, as we've been doing. So we have a policy space. Um, we have a politician who makes a proposal. Uh, that politician has quadratic utility. Let me just write this down. So this is the ideal point of the politician. Um, they have quadratic utility. Um, they're, you know, the, we, we can say there's a, you know, an odd number of voters, but we already know the, the only one who really matters is that median voter. So this is the ideal point of the median voter. Um, all right. Uh, yes, and they have quadratic utility as well. All right, now instead of writing the status quo, um, I'm going to think about there being another politician. So now we're going to have, you know, in, in previous installments, we've had interaction between a politician and the voters. Um, now we're going to have interaction between the politicians. Um, there's a lot of different ways to set this up, and it's interesting to explore different structure and, and how that affects the model. Uh, what I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to have um, two politicians, and the first politician is going to set the status quo. Um, so, so instead of the status quo, I'm going to specify another politician, but because in this version of the model, they're going to move first, I'm going to call them politician one. And um, their ideal point is going to be P with a subscript 1. Um, so they're going to propose, uh, let me finish it. So they have Euclidean preferences. They are going to propose some policy. 
and then the next politician is going to make a counter proposal okay so we're going to call that politician 2 and we're going to uh, index their ideal point with a 2 um, and I'm just noticing I'm messing up here because there's no V all right so that's P1 so um, okay right politician 1 let me just put the timing here this is something we might want to write out now so first um, politician 1 proposes some policy x1 then after seeing that proposal politician 2 proposes another policy let's say x2 and then after seeing um, both of those proposals um, there's a majority vote in some committee and we kind of know how that works now we're going to be imposing the optimality principle on all of the actors in this model um, in particular both politicians are going to be assumed to um, act rationally and optimally um, this means that the very first politician politician one has to be able to anticipate the policy outcome any different proposal they make we're going to assume for simplicity that politician one knows the preferences of politician two knows the preferences of the voters politician two also knows the preferences of the voters um, and um, so that's how that works now maybe you can tell here once politician one has made a proposal uh, I should say that's that's a majority vote between x1 and x2 so once politician one has made a proposal x1 the rest of this interaction looks just like the model in the previous installment where um, x1 is like the status quo okay um, so we kind of understand we already know how that part of the model works um, so basically uh, we had an exogenous status quo um, we drew a picture for it at that time um, which was something like this um, we used the horizontal axis to represent the status quo um, the vertical was representing the policy proposal and um, if the voter was there and the politician was over here um, the optimal proposal well uh, for status quo is between the voter and the politician um, the policy outcome was just the status quo um, so the graph of this is just on the 45 degree line and then um, for status quo is to the right of the politician the politician would just get their ideal point for status quo to the left of the voter um, the politician would propose the right hand endpoint of that acceptance interval and, um, and then eventually that would go up and flat flatten out again um, okay that was the model with an exogenous status quo and um, and then we you know we said suppose we have multiple voters well that's just the median voter now um, who plays the role of the voter um, now we're in this model where there's two politicians here we're looking at the policy choice of um, the second politician as a function of x1 the proposal of the first politician right so the blue this blue function is the optimal proposal of 
politician2 as a function of x1. All right, and now what we want to do is complete the analysis of the model by figuring out what proposal the first politician actually makes. What's x1 going to be? All right, so, um, well, that's ultimately going to depend on where politician 1 is located in this picture. I'm going to focus on what I think is the more interesting case of um, politician 1 being on the other side of the median voter. Um, that's generally true in models like this, that the interesting case is where um, you know, the politicians are on opposite sides of this critical voter um, because that really maximizes competition between the political actors. And, um, and so we'll stick with that here. We'll assume that the, the politicians are diametrically opposed relative to this median voter. All right, so we have to ask um, what is the um, optimal choice of politician one? All right, well, to see this in this picture, um, let me just continue the 45 degree line out like this. And um, I want to put politician one on the vertical axis as well. And now I want you to um, look at things, kind of focus on the, the vertical axis, okay? Um, because uh, this axis is kind of telling us what the policy outcomes are going to be for different x1s, right? Um, so for an x1 here, what's the policy outcome? There it is. And you can see that that's pretty far from politician one. That would not be a very good policy proposal. Um, in fact, if we are really focusing on this vertical axis, let's get rid of this, this is annoying. Um, here's politician one. What are the different policies that that politician can get by varying their initial proposal? Um, well, we just saw they can get um, they can get this one here um, if they chose an X1 that was closer to the voter, they would get this here. And you can just see that you can sweep out anything. Maybe I should use red for this. You can sweep out anything in this portion um, of the vertical axis. And in fact, if you propose, say, an X1 here, um, then the outcome is going to be down here, and you can actually get anything here. In fact, um, the set of policies that you can get by varying x1, the way you can see that is just by projecting this um, function um, horizontally to the vertical axis. I don't know if that's clear, but anything in this red interval is achievable by some choice of x1. Okay. So here you are, your politician p1. Now I'm putting you on the vertical axis here to see things better. You can get any policy in this red interval. You have Euclidean preferences. You want policies that are as close as possible to your ideal point. Clearly, the best policy you can get is this one right here. This is the best achievable policy for politician one. Okay. Um, so we can see by using our previous analysis for, you know, we're actually using the comparative statics we did on the status quo. We can see what the best policy is uh, you know, the best policy achievable is for politician one. Okay. So what is that actually? Well, um, I hope it's not too messy here, but um, that is just the median voter's ideal point. 
right? Here's the median voter. This is the 45 degree line. So um, in fact, the best possible outcome for politician one is the median voter's ideal point. The way they get that is by proposing the median voter's ideal point. Um, in fact, this isn't even that uh, surprising. If they propose something to the right of the median voter, well, politician two will just say, thanks, I'll take that. If they propose something to the left of the median voter, that doesn't help them either because it creates an agreement interval and politician one just takes the right-hand endpoint of that. The best thing that politician one can do is um, you know, is to move in toward the median voter, which reduces this agreement interval and, um, or appro approval interval. And, um, and then, you know, the optimal is, is the median voter's ideal point. So um, this is, uh, it's kind of an interesting feature of the model that from this um, kind of, remember I, I chose I located these politicians so that the competition was as intense as possible. They were diametrically opposed to the median, but that competition drove them in toward the median uh, in the end, right? Um, so this is a, an example of a median voter theorem. It's something that comes up quite a bit and has different forms. Um, this is just a, a simple version of it, um, but we'll see it in uh, in models in the future as well. Okay, so I think I, I've said enough about the one-dimensional policy choice model for a little while. Um, we will come back to it because it is such a fundamental and useful model, um, but we're actually gonna switch modes and go back to more of an economics model in the next installment, and we're going to talk about the theory of the consumer.